The idea of communicating with intelligent life from a different world has been around for a long time. But as technology has improved, the way we try to listen for that intelligence has changed a lot. One of the first people to listen for invisible electromagnetic signals from space was a man also credited with inventing the radio, and who even has a unit of measurement named after him. In 1899, Nikola Tesla claimed to have detected signals from Mars. Tesla wrote, the changes I noted were taking place periodically, and with such a clear suggestion of number and order that they were not traceable to any cause then known to me. I was familiar, of course, with such electrical disturbances as are produced by the sun, aurora borealis, and earth currents, and I was as sure as I could be of any fact that these variations were due to none of these causes. The nature of my experiments precluded the possibility of the changes being produced by atmospheric disturbances. It was some time afterward when the thought flashed upon my mind that the disturbance I had observed might be due to an intelligent control. Although I could not decipher their meaning, it was impossible for me to think of them as having been entirely accidental. Another man also credited with inventing the radio. Marconi too heard mysterious signals he thought might have come from Mars. Around the turn of the century, a lot of people thought that Mars might be a somewhat hospitable place. The whole idea that Mars had canals and water was laid to rest when we got a very good look at it in 1909. Now we know that Mars is a cold, empty desert, but we're still investigating the presence of water and the possibility that even if it does not contain life, it might have at some time in the past. So then, in 1959, Caccioni and Morrison write the first paper proposing the microwave band as a good SETI candidate. They started out by ruling out frequencies which are absorbed by the atmosphere and those with interference from local or galactic phenomena. They also specified the neutral hydrogen emission line at about 1420 MHz as a good target frequency, as it is a very fundamental signal that anyone who studied hydrogen and radio waves would likely be aware of. Then in 1971, Bernard Oliver first dubbed the area between the hydrogen and hydroxyl emission lines the water hole. This is an area where a lot of SETI work has been focused because these are the ingredients in water, and we speculate that other life forms might be based on it. And we have seen some signals. In 1960, Frank Drake, who would later derive the Drake equation, started Project Ozma, the first serious attempt at SETI using a 25 meter radio telescope. Drake did detect an extremely suspicious signal, but it ended up being interference from a secret military radar system. In 1977, an astronomer at the Big Ear Radio Telescope saw what is now known as the WOW signal. This was a signal that should have been very unlikely to have come from any natural phenomena. However, no further signals were detected. It's now thought that this was probably caused by some kind of terrestrial interference. Intentional signals, we believe we can apply what's called the principle of anti-cryptography. In wartime, we have people who are called cryptographers. It's their job to encode the signals in such a way as to make it as difficult as possible for the other guy to figure out what's going on. Anti-cryptography is the opposite of that. We reason that if someone is going to go to the effort to build a transmitter to send signals to some other civilization, they will make it as easy as possible for the other guy to find them. Because that's the whole idea of what they're trying to do. So then, with that assumption, it leads us to construction of the search strategy. The problem is, our galaxy is truly immense. This is us just here. That star is the sun. And this is the area we've searched so far for alien signals. Not bad, until you see just how many stars there are to search. How many advanced civilizations capable, at least of radio astronomy, are there in the Milky Way galaxy? Let's call the number of such civilizations by the capital letter N. It's a number. It depends on many things. It depends on the total number of stars in the Milky Way. Let's call that um, N sub star. It depends on the fraction of stars that have planets. Let's call that F sub P. It depends on the average number of planets in a given solar system that are ecologically suitable for life. Let's call that N sub E. It depends on the fraction of suitable planets in which life actually arises. Call that F sub L. It depends on the fraction of inhabited planets on which intelligence emerges. Let's call that F sub I. And on the fraction of those planets in which the intelligent beings evolve a technical communicative civilization, 
call that f sub c. Finally, it depends on the fraction of a planet's lifetime that's graced by a technical civilization. Call that f sub l.